All right, now as I mentioned, uh, VPMP is equal to V star M star. It is also true the way you figure out where the center of mass is, DP uh, MP is equal to D star M star. And the whole point of this is that this is a large quantity compared to the mass of the planet, and therefore these are small quantities compared to the, to, uh, the, distance, the distances and velocities uh, uh, taken by the planet. Small, but as it turns out, uh, measurable. In particular, the velocity uh, is the thing, the velocity of the star turns out to be the thing that you can measure. And so that's how you find, uh, determine that there's an exoplanet there. What you do is you look for the reflex motion of the star. Planets going around the star, stars going around the center of mass also, uh, and that is a motion that now, these days, can be observed. And you can see why this might have happened only very recently, because that motion is really very small. Let me give you some masses, just to give you a sense of this. We've already, I've already written down that the sun's mass is about 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. Uh, just for reference, the Earth's mass is 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. So down by almost a factor of a million. Uh, and so uh, the Sun moves much slower than the Earth does due to their mutual gravity. Jupiter is the most massive of the planets, uh, uh, and it's at about 2 times 10 to the 27 kilograms, so a thousand times smaller than the Sun. And so, of course, the Sun moves a thousand times less because of Jupiter than it does because of the Earth. Now, of course, the Sun actually responds to all of these planets, so it's actually executing some complicated motion, which is the sum of the motions induced by all the planets. But in fact, uh, Jupiter is, is, is significantly more massive than the rest of the planets, so the, by far the dominant motion that the Sun goes through uh, has to do with the orbit of Jupiter. And so the consequence of this, because the masses are so much small, smaller, is that the velocity of the star is much, much less. These two less than signs means much, much less than the velocity of the planet. Uh, but ca it can nevertheless be detected. OK. Now, what do we expect to see? Supposing you can now go out and through means that we'll actually talk about on Thursday, uh, actually measure the velocities uh, of stars in response to planets. What do you expect uh, to see uh, in those, uh, in other stars? Uh, and basically the answer to that is what you expect to see uh, depends on what your expectations for solar systems are. We've got one example, or at least uh, 10 years ago, we had only one example. And so uh, you have to take what you know about our own solar system and infer what other solar systems uh, might want to look like. And so at this point, I want to show you some things about our own solar system. Uh, so a little slideshow of the solar system here. All right. Don't take notes. Uh, I'll tell you everything you need to know after we finish the pretty pictures. Um, OK, so starting from the inner, uh, innermost part of the solar system, this is the innermost planet. This is the planet Mercury. Looks much like the moon. It's basically a rock uh, with craters on it. Uh, there was a time when we thought that its spin period was exactly the same as its orbital period, so it keeps one face to the sun. There's all kinds of science fiction based on that. That turns out not to be true. Uh, but uh, uh, basically, uh, it's kind of a hot rock. That's all you need to know about Mercury. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, here's a close-up of a little piece of uh, Mercury surface, and you would have a tough time telling that this was uh, Mercury rather than the Moon or many other objects, uh, uh, rocky objects in the solar system. Next one out is Venus. Uh, Venus looks quite different because it's got a very thick atmosphere, very thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. This is all clouds that you're looking at here. Uh, and in fact, 
the greenhouse effect, which is supposed to be responsible perhaps for global warming, was first studied and identified on Venus uh, because it appears to have run amok on Venus. The surface of Venus is extremely hot, uh, and it's covered with these really thick clouds. So it was quite hard for a long time to get a handle on what was going on down on the surface. Uh, this has now, however, been accomplished. Uh, they've put things into orbit that have radar and can uh, uh, view the topography view the, through the clouds. They've also dropped things onto the surface of Venus. The problem is it's 700 degrees and it rains sulfur down there. Uh, so it's an unpleasant environment for machinery. So things don't last very long. But nevertheless, uh, they've gotten some information uh, here's a little Venus landscape. It's artif entirely artificially colored, right? Uh, but the topography uh, comes from these radar mapping missions. Uh, and uh, here is a map of the whole of Venus uh, made by these, uh, these orbiting missions. Uh, and so Venus is important uh, primarily for, uh, for its atmosphere and as a kind of warning for what might uh, potentially one day happen here if we're not careful. Uh, okay, this is the third rock from the sun. 99% uh, of all Yale courses deal with what's going on on this little piece of cosmic <laughs> debris. I'm not going to say any more about it, therefore. Uh, oh, except for one thing. It comes uh, with this companion object. This is the moon. Uh, the moon is a very special thing because relative to its planet, it's huge. This really shouldn't be thought of as a planet and a moon, but rather as a double planet. Uh, here they are to scale. Uh, and that's much closer in, s in size than any other moon planet system uh, around the major planets. Uh, moving outwards, uh, we come to Mars. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is about as good an image of Mars as you can get from the Earth. And you can see why people got excited about it. These blotchy things here turn out to change with time. And in fact, they change with the Martian seasons. So people got very excited, thought, oh my goodness, it's vegetation. You know, the seasons come, go. Uh, and there's a polar ice cap up there, obviously. And uh, a hundred years ago, people uh, somehow convinced themselves that there were canals and maybe cities and maybe people all over this planet. Uh, this turns out to be wrong. It isn't vegetation. It's actually dust storms that change changes what you see. And by now we have uh, some much more close-up views uh, from things like the Viking missions and, and a number of more recent uh, missions. And this is basically uh, what the surface of Mars looks like. It has this slight reddish tint overall, uh, and it's a bunch of rocks. It has, uh, it has an atmosphere, although it's less thick than the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, now, one of the interesting things about Mars is you can see features that look like this. Uh, and uh, this looks very much like river uh, deltas. You know, you see these little tributaries coming into a big river. This kind of looks like uh, uh, Louisiana or something like that. And so uh, uh, people are pretty much convinced that there was once running water on Mars. Uh, and that's important because uh, it is thought that the existence of life as we know it uh, is, uh, uh, is dependent on the existence of liquid water. Uh, for a long time, uh, people thought that there was no liquid water now on Mars. It turns out that the particular temperature and uh, atmospheric pressure that exists on Mars uh, means that water goes from the solid state, from ice, and sublimes directly into the, uh, 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 into the gaseous state, much like carbon dioxide does here. You have, that's why it's called dry ice, because carbon dioxide, when you freeze it, uh, and, war and then warm it up again, turns directly into gas. Water is supposed to do the same on Mars. But there was, just a month ago, uh, this interesting uh, uh, picture published. This is from an orbiting, uh, a, a satellite orbiting Mars that's been taking a lot of pictures. This is pictures of two identical uh, uh, parts of the Martian surface, one from 1999, one from 2005. And the claim is that there's new stuff down here, and that the way and the pattern of that new stuff and the way it must have come on is from stuff flowing downhill down the side of this crater. Uh, and so now people are thinking maybe there is something flowing around on Mars, although clearly not uh, all that much of it. But that would be exciting if it was confirmed. OK, out beyond Mars, 
uh, is the asteroid belt filled with rocky chunks of stuff that look <coughs> vaguely like this, many, many of them. There are asteroids all over the solar system. Uh, most of them are between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, but there are other families that are elsewhere. Some of these other families, it has been suggested, uh, come from uh, the asteroid belt, but they've had collisions or other catastrophes and have been uh, bumped into different orbits. But most of the asteroids are between uh, Mars and Jupiter. Now, out beyond uh, the asteroid belt are a number of other planets, and much of what we know about these other planets come from a couple of satellites that look kind of like this. These are the Voyager satellites that were launched in the 1970s and have been traveling through the outer solar system ever since. Uh, this is a clever thing that they did. Uh, it turned out that uh, in the 70s and 80s, the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Uranus and Neptune were aligned in such a way that one satellite could catch them all as they went past. And each time it goes past one of these things, it uses the gravitational attraction of that planet to swing itself to the next one and then to the next one and then to the next one. And so uh, these wonderful satellites for many years gave us uh, pictures of one planet after another, uh, which, now, uh, which we now know quite a lot more about than we used to. Uh, so here's Jupiter. Uh, this is by far the most massive planet. Here you've got the famous red spot. All that you see here is atmosphere, and it's got very elaborate weather. Uh, and the red spot uh, turns out to be a hurricane that has persisted for about 350 years. Uh, to us, it seems like a, a, an almost permanent feature, although it's gotten fainter recently. Um, but it's sort of as if, supposing you were a race of creatures uh, whose uh, lifetime was about half a day and you were observing the Earth, and you observed it for many lifetimes, and you saw the same hurricane sitting down somewhere in the Caribbean. You would think that that little spot uh, was kind of a permanent feature, and that seems to be what this is. It's a sort of really long-lasting hurricane. If you have, a, if you have you, they have time-lapse movies of this. You can find them on the internet, uh, where you can see that the, the wind is actually circulating there. Uh, Jupiter has moons, many of them. These, the four big ones you see here are the so-called Galilean moons because they were discovered by Galileo. Uh, they've also included a little one. There are many dozens of moons this size. The moons, each of the moons has its own peculiar characteristics. I'm quite fond of this one. This is the innermost moon. It's called Io, uh, sometimes referred to as the pepperoni pizza moon. Uh, and it's got uh, the most elaborate volcanoes anywhere in the solar system. It spews up sulfur uh, all the time. And, uh, and then this sulfur sort of melts and flows all over the surface, and that's what gives it its particular color. Each of the other moons has interesting characteristics of its own. Uh, here's an interesting thing that the Voyager satellites discovered. Uh, and, uh, they discovered that Jupiter has rings. Uh, it, it was not thought that Jupiter had rings. From the Earth, you can't see them. Uh, but from close up, it became apparent that uh, Jupiter has rings uh, the same way Saturn does. But of course, the Saturn rings are the most spectacular. Here's Saturn, the next planet out. You can see that it, too, has weather banded things down here. And then it has these very spectacular rings seen here in various from various different angles uh, as Saturn goes through its orbit. Uh, and these rings, we now know, are made up of uh, uh, individual little chunks of things. Uh, the Voyager mission, this is obviously artificially colored so that you can see all the different rings. And each one of those rings is made up of many, many, many little rocks. Saturn, too, has moons. This is Titan, Saturn's big moon. And you can see uh, from here in this particular picture that Titan has an atmosphere. That makes it very interesting. People have the feeling that uh, 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 places where there are atmospheres are potential sources of life. And so people find Titan an interesting moon. Uh, I actually like this one better. Uh, this is Mimas. It's a, just a rocky moon. But you can see it's kind of got the great-grandmother of all craters up there. Uh, this thing got slammed into by some asteroid that was just barely not big enough to blow the whole thing apart. Uh, and, but it raised this big pucker on the side of the moon. Uh, moving out to the next planet, uh, which is Uranus. Uh, in ordinary light, you can't actually see any features. Again, you're looking at the atmosphere. There are clouds. Uh, but this picture was uh, taken in uh, a particular kind of red light, which uh, brings out the cloud features. 
And uh, what you can see is it's got a banded structure, the same as Jupiter and Saturn. But it, uh, interestingly, the bands are on its side. One of the peculiar features of, Jupiter, uh, of Uranus is that it, is, is that it uh, rotates sideways rather than kind of up and down, uh, uniquely among the planets. Uh, this planet, too, has rings. It also has moons. Here's another favorite moon of mine. Uh, this is Miranda, and this looks like what happened was that it actually did get blown apart by some impact, but then fell back together again. And you can see that it looks like it's been chopped into pieces and then sort of thrown back into uh, 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 together again. Moving out to the next planet, here's Neptune. Neptune again has weather. Uh, here is the big dark spot on, on Neptune, similar to the big red spot on, uh, uh, on Jupiter. This little cloud here is called Scooter because it moves faster than the, uh, 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 than the rest of the weather on Neptune. It's actually kind of a mystery how come Neptune has all this weather because it's very cold out there. There isn't a whole lot of energy that should be in the atmosphere, and nobody can quite figure out how this is supposed to work. Neptune has moons. Here's, here's Neptune's biggest moon. This is Triton. You can see this sort of frontier here between two types of topography sort of moves around, uh, and that is a uh, thought to be due to uh, weather of various kinds, methane, snow, stuff like that. Uh, and then by now, this was the last planet uh, Voyager 2 uh, examined, and then it went past, and it took, this, took a lovely shot uh, looking back at the solar system. Here's Neptune and Triton uh, as uh, the Voyager mission moved out uh, into the uh, outer solar system beyond the large planets. 